Welcome to Moments with Marianne. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very inspiring show coming right up with two very special guests. Our first guest today is Eliza Kelly, and she's here to share with us her new book, Starring You, A Guided Journey Through Astrology. So Eliza is a New York City-based astrologer and writer, and she's the author of two books. Her first book, The Mixology of Astrology, Cosmic Cocktail Recipes for Every Sign, was a huge hit. Eliza's horoscope and columns have appeared in Cosmopolitan, and her work has been featured in Allure, Vogue, Paper, Bustle, Refinery29, Huffington Post, and Girl Boss. So let's welcome to the show, Eliza Kelly. Hi, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. You know, what an honor it is to have you here and to talk about this new book. I mean, I loved it. A lot of times when people talk about astrology, they're like, what the heck is that? <laughs> yeah, I. one of the reasons that I wanted to create this book is that I saw that there was a need for just um, being able to synthesize this information in a very accessible way um, so that people could really understand just, you know, uh, something that was really comprehensive, but wasn't too complex or technical so that mm-hmm. people could incorporate it into their lives in a meaningful way. So why don't you share with us a little bit about the history of astrology? Because I know there's there's quite an expansive history of it. Sure. So astrology started um, quite a long time ago. It's a very ancient practice. It started with the Babylonians. Um, and those that was really the culture that had created the infrastructure for the zodiac. Um, they were the the culture that divided the sky up into these different segments, into this 360 wheel. And then from there, various ancient cultures um, sort of imposed their own mythology and their own archetypes on that. So I study Western astrology, which has a lot of basis in uh, Greek and Roman mythology, but there's also Vedic astrology, which incorporates Indian culture into it. There's Chinese astrology, Korean astrology, and all of these have used the same outline that was structured by the Babylonians, but have incorporated their own language and their own philosophies into it. So do you just choose the one that you think resonates with you when you start to work with astrology? Well, I studied art history in college, um, and I I went to college here in the United States. So um, as a, I guess, a U.S. native, um, to me, the Greco-Roman mythology is something that is, is a language that I really sort of innately understood. So there wasn't a language barrier for me to understand sort of the the allegories and the archetypes. Um, So it was just sort of the default practice that I began exploring. Um, And then that's also the, the Western astrology is what we here in the U S that's the astrology that we are reading in magazines um, when we're little kids and we're trying to see if what, which sign we're compatible with. So it's very much infused within the culture. So when we look at your book, Starring You, who is that book written for? Is it just for anybody or just people who are curious about astrology? Well, I really wrote it um, to be used by by younger readers um, in particular. Um, That was what I set out to achieve with Starring You. Um, I wanted it to be, you know, the subtitle is A Guided Journey Through Astrology, and I wanted it to be a very interactive piece where people could personalize the astrology content and make it their own. And then as I was writing it, and as it was sort of coming into fruition, I realized that this is not just something for young readers. This is really something for everyone. Well, it's pretty interesting because I think as someone starting their journey with astrology and learning what that's all about, you know, it's your book is a really good place for them to start. And I know we talked about this a little bit, but when we look at astrology itself, what is astrology? So astrology is the interpretation and the study of the different planets uh, and celestial bodies as they relate to their zodiac signs. And then as that informs and relates to life here on earth. 
Okay. Well, and so what are the signs of the Zodiac? Why don't we start there? Because I think sometimes people get a little confused about that. So the signs of the Zodiac are we have Aries, um, which is the first sign of the Zodiac, which moves into Taurus, which moves into Gemini, which moves into Cancer, Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius, and Pisces. Okay. In your book, you have listed the dates and the elements. Why don't you share with us a little bit about the elements for each of the signs? Like, Why is that important for us to know? Well, I love working with the elements. In fact, I find that to be one of the most effective ways of learning and studying and incorporating this astrological content into one's life. Um, There are four elements. There's fire, which uh, embodies Aries, Leo, and Sagittarius. Fire energy is very passion-driven. It is it sort of has that Joe Devere. It's determined to sort of live life. Um, in driven by its heart in the best ways possible. Then we have earth energy, which is the, the signs Taurus, Virgo, and Capricorn. These signs are associated with pragmatism, with physicality, with logic, with stability. So these are this element, it, the earth element is very much about sort of the physical world and creating structures. Um, Then we have the air element, which is air, Libra, and Aquarius. And air, as it does, um, as we understand it to be, moves things. So air is an inherently social element. So all of these different signs, Gemini, Libra, and Aquarius, are very much interested and concerned with how are we influencing others? What is communication? How are we being affected by humanity, society, and how can we do our part to give back in a meaningful way? And then lastly, we have the water element, which is Cancer, Scorpio, and Pisces. Water in astrology um, and in most mystical traditions is associated with emotions and intuition. So these signs are the most sensitive, the most psychic. Um, They are very much interested in the way that we feel about things and in deriving their power and their energy from being able to absorb um, the non-physical world, the energies that people are expelling and to incorporate that into the way that they move through reality. Um, It's important to note that we have all signs within our birth charts. We have all of the 12 signs, which means that we have all of these elements and we can pick and choose when we would like to work with the different elements. So I really love to focus on these four different elements because I think it's a really great way of problem solving, of moving through your day, um, of dealing with different situations. Sometimes we need a little bit more spark. Sometimes we need to be uncompromising. We are tapping into our fire energy. Sometimes we need a little more empathy and compassion which would encourage us to tap into the water component of our chart. So I think that those are are fabulous ways of sort of subdividing and thinking about the Zodiac, but then also working with that in our daily life. So how do people use the Zodiac in, in their daily lives? I know you talked about it just personally, but can they use it with relationships and work? Yeah. So um, astrology, as I had said, you know, the way that I define it is an interpretation of how it relates to our life here on earth. Um, but in our contemporary times, we really use astrology as a lens to better understand self and other. So I see astrology as a practice in empathy. I see it as a way of being able to understand our incredible multidimensionality Um, as a way of being able to recognize that my needs might be different than your needs. So I encourage people to spend a lot of time with their birth chart, with their astrology to understand sort of what makes them who they are um, and use this as a language of being able to understand why they make the decisions they make, why they feel the way they do, why they act the way they do. And then to also use that to help improve and empower their relationships with other people in their lives, whether that be their lovers, their colleagues, uh, their family members, whoever it is that they have an interpersonal connection with. Astrology can help provide more insight into 
that individual's own unique profile and how you can um, better interact with them. So now moving to the sun sign, what is that and how is that important with everything that we've been talking about? So your sun sign is quite literally the position of the sun at your exact moment of birth. Um, So this is when people usually, you know, talk about astrology. It is their entry point into this. Um, It is based on the day that you were born. So you don't need all of the other details such as time and location in order to be able to access that information about yourself. The sun sign really shows you how you radiate, how you exude your warmth, the way that people uh, sort of respond to you, just as the same way that the sun in the sky has a total influence on our mood, on our the way that we go about our day. The sun in our chart really shows how we are um, radiating and illuminating on a day-to-day basis. So I always say to my clients that whenever they're feeling lost or confused or um, directionless, the fastest way to really get back and center themselves is to is to work on understanding what their sun sign wants. Um, and the sun sign, of course, you know, there's 12 different signs of the zodiac. So there's a lot of different ways that that sun can illuminate and, and feel joy and take up space. Well, I love how you explain that and how it brings it all together. It makes it very easy to understand. You even talk about something that was kind of new to me. I had no idea, which was secret signs. And I'd love for you to dive into that for our listeners. Well, this is actually a, a concept that I created. Um, it is something that I cultivated myself, and it I'm really excited about it because as astrologers, we're always trying to figure out how can we synthesize this information and put our sort of own unique spin on it. Um, and how I came up with the concept of secret signs is that I really wanted to communicate in this book that we are more complex than just our sun sign. Um, of course, by looking at one's birth chart and understanding the position of all of the different planets and celestial bodies, we get a much more comprehensive and detailed understanding of, of how these different energies work together. But with the secret sign, I wanted to showcase that um, we have these, we, ha- we are these multidimensional beings who have these different qualities and properties. So who you connect with may not be who what you read about for your sun sign. Who you feel on the in, how, on the inside that you are may not be completely captured in your sun sign, and that's totally normal and totally uh, makes sense. You know that is exactly how astrology works. We don't want to typecast people or put people in boxes with this content. We want to um, empower them and enable them to find the full range of their emotions and their personhood. So with the secret sign, I wanted to introduce this concept in a fun and um, more playful way and something that hasn't been done before. Yeah, I was very intrigued by that. I loved how you pulled all that together. And it makes, again, a lot of sense. And it's interesting, you know, there's so much I learned from this book. And here I think I know at least a little bit about astrology. And then you broke it down then into the personal planets and the outer planets. And that's always been something that's kind of confused me a little bit. So I'd love for you to share that with our listeners as well. So I, um, I broke it down into the personal planets and into the outer planets because that's one of the best ways of being able to sort of understand the celestial bodies that influence and inform our day-to-day experience versus the planets and celestial bodies that inform our lifelong uh, experiences, things that have more to do with the themes of our reality over time. So the personal planets and celestial bodies uh, consist of the sun, moon, Mercury, Venus, and Mars. These orbits are a lot faster Um, So as we know, the sun has a year-long orbit, 365 days. The moon has a 28-day orbit. Um, The the slowest orbit of those is Mars, which is a two-year orbit. But all of those individually are going to give us insight as to sort of how we move through time on either an annual basis or even a monthly basis. 
Um, with the moon, of course, because it's moving so fast, it's week to week. It's showing our emotions as they oscillate over that 28-day cycle. And then past the asteroid belt, when we look at the, ast- the outer planets, we have Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. And these planets have a much longer orbits. Jupiter is a 12-year orbit, and then Pluto is a 248-year orbit. So these are things that uh, are not just pertinent to our experiences, but also showcase life cycles, um, generations and generations of how we are seeing reality, how we're perceiving things, entire eras of time. So those planets are, are giving us sort of the macro, whereas the personal planets are giving us the micro. And so you broke it down and how they can really figure out, people can really figure out their ruling planet. Why is it important to know that? The ruling planet is important because it really shows what your, um, which celestial body or planet that you have this innate deep connection to. Um, And in the same way, we can always look to the sun to say, what makes me happy? What makes me shine? When we identify what our planetary ruler is, we could sort of understand what, which celestial body we have a Uh, a deep inherent connection to, and we can utilize that energy, the energies of that planet in order to help uh, direct and inform our life. And then also provide us with information as to sort of our secret uh, special gifts and abilities. I like to call them our superpowers. So this kind of brings me to my next question, because a lot of times you hear about the different phases of the sun and the moon how are these, how can we use these phases to benefit our journey? So I love, the sun is incredible because the sun is just consistent. It is, you see, you know, barring eclipses, which sort of, uh, you know, are these shocking occurrences that occur, you know, three to seven times each year, which can change the way that we see the sun. The sun is a very consistent celestial body. The sun and moons are both the sun and moon are both called luminaries in astrology. So the sun is sort of consistent in astrology. It has a fixed energy, which means that it is stable. The sun is very consistent in what it offers and the way that it shines, whereas the moon is constantly oscillating. Um, within the 28-day cycle of the moon, it goes through eight distinctive phases. So it goes from the new moon phase, which begins the lunar cycle, and then it has its culmination at the full moon phase, and then it goes back down and disappears again into the new moon. So I love encouraging people to work with this with these different phases because, first of all, it helps break up time in a more meaningful way. Um, you know, I find that just based on our Gregorian calendar, uh, it's easy to sort of be like, oh, I had a horrible October or the fall was a bad season. When we break things up into lunar increments, um, so from the new moon to the full moon and then from the full moon back to the new moon, which is really like a two and a half week period, it gives us shorter, um, more bite-sized digestible units of time where we can say, Yes, during this time, I was feeling frustrated, I was feeling angry, but then after the full moon, after I had these realizations, I started to let it all go and release it. And we can, uh, you know, our bodies are are so deeply connected to the moon cycle, um, even, you know, just separately from the fact that we are majority water, and we know that the moon has an immense influence on the tides and on the ocean and gravity at large. Um, For the majority of human history, we did not have electricity in the same way that we do. So we, as species, would depend on whether the moon was in its new moon phase when it was totally dark, or if we had maximum nighttime illumination during the full moon phase, that would be when we would plan nighttime travel, we would be more awake at night. So being in touch with how the moon, even if we can't see it, if we're in an urban environment, um, just noting what's going on in the sky is going to give you so much information about how you fluctuate emotionally, how you feel about things at different times. And you can use that to your advantage to really um, 
to, to let things go, to embrace new experiences, to have new sensations. Um, and, and I really highly encourage people to always focus on that. Well, you talk about something in your book that I think I hear a lot of the time when people talk about retrogrades. Uh, you know? yes. So <laughs> I would love for you to share that with our listeners. And is there ever a good time during a retrograde as well? Yes. I mean, I would say that retrogrades get, you know, when we talk about retrogrades, uh, we mostly refer to Mercury. So Mercury is the planet of communication. Um, so it governs everything that has to do with transmission, um, which includes the way that we interact with each other, our dialogue, our emails, our commutes, anything that is sort of moving something from one place to another. So Mercury, so we live in this extraordinarily mercurial world. So when Mercury goes retrograde, which is an optical illusion, which um, makes it appear to go backwards, our communication, our uh, technology, our transportation all gets influenced because it wants it's going backwards. So it wants us to pause. Um, this isn't inherently a bad thing. You know, we can't always just bulldoze ahead um, without taking a moment to just sit and reflect and make sure that we're even moving in a direction that is still meaningful to us. But obviously, because we live in this mercurial world, it creates problems email breakdowns, transportation delays, et cetera. But I am a big advocate of retrogrades because I think that having some carved out time to be a little bit more introspective, to be a little bit more, um, to to be a little more gentle with the way that we proceed is something that we can all benefit from. So I'm so glad that you took the time to talk about that because, you know, retrogrades do kind of get this bad rap and it's, you know, in your book, you really kind of outline how there's also a great opportunity with it, you know, with the different ones that happen. Why don't you share like a retrograde from another planet? Sure. So all, um, all of the planets go retrograde, the moon and the sun, which are not considered, they're, they're luminary. So they're not planets don't go retrograde, but everything from Mercury through Pluto goes backwards, um, in different durations of time. Uh, Pluto's retrograde, for instance, which is the furthest out celestial body that at least um, most astrologers track that we have featured in Star and Mew, um, goes retrograde for all, all, the majority of its orbit is it's spinning backwards. And the reason it's doing this is because Pluto is the planet that's associated with rebirth and regeneration and transformation. So before we seal the deal on the way that we're evolving, we need to sort of implement those theories and those techniques. So we need to go backwards to make sure that the areas of life that we hadn't been evolving in then um, then receive that sort of knowledge and extra love so that we can continue to proceed ahead accordingly. So you have what's called the natal charts that I would love for you to explain what those are and how they work with all of this. So your natal chart is a snapshot of the sky at your exact moment of birth. So it really is a, a two dimensional depiction of this three dimensional, uh, of this, of this entire three dimensional world this band of the zodiac that encompasses earth. And what we see with that is, um, is basically how all of these different planets and celestial bodies work together. Um, we can identify which have good relationships with each other, which are working harmoniously, and then which are a little bit more tense. Um, when we have tension between the planets and celestial bodies, it doesn't mean that we're inherently doomed or we're screwed up. It just means that those, um, those different ways that we express ourselves, those different lessons that we have, whatever it may be, um, are sort of informing each other and pushing each other, challenging each other to become the best versions of themselves. So when we use astrology in everyday life, what are some other ways that we can use it to navigate maybe through difficult situations? So I think first and foremost, recognizing that everything is cyclical um, is a 
huge aspect of astrology and why I love working with it so much. Um, there are there's so much information that we can use from our past to inform our future. Um, something that really resonated with me many years ago when I read it for the first time was actually a scientific principle, which is that they studied um, patients who had amnesia. And not only did could they not remember their past, but they couldn't even make the most simple predictions for their future. Um, they could not concretely say that the next morning they were going to wake up and drink coffee. And what scientists learned from that is that being able to remember what has happened allows us to um, to look ahead and to understand the different choices and the different um, decisions that we could potentially make in the future. So that same principle applies to astrology. Um, astrology is all orbits. It's all cycles. So when we understand what these cycles mean and how they influence our lives, especially by looking backwards to say, okay, this happened to me in 2008. This happened to me in 2013. What was going on in my life then? How has this changed? We can take more agency and we can have more choice so that we aren't just sort of like mulling along, um, living through the same exact cycles over and over again, dating the same stupid guys, having the same bad jobs that we hate, but we can redirect those orbits to make choices in our life that are more meaningful and that are more honest um, to what we believe, to what our values are and to what we want to accomplish and achieve. How empowering is that? I've had my natal chart done and you get it and it's like, okay, you've got this information. So do you do you have times where people also schedule um, like a, you know appointments or sessions with you where they can go ahead and really dive deep into their natal charts? Yes, one of my the big parts of my practice is that I have a private practice, so I work one on one with clients. Um, people can schedule it directly on my website. My whole calendar is up there. Um, all of my clients, uh, even if they're, we're in the same city, we work on the phone together. Um, I find that that's the best way of being able to share information um, without you know, worrying about the technology breakdowns of FaceTime or even you know, interpreting their facial expressions um, in such a way where I'm like, oh no, uh, what did I say? I can just go into their chart, <laughs> deliver the information, work with them, have a do- have a dialogue, have a conversation, and we can make plans together. Um, you know, I think that a lot of the wisdom of astrology is is just the wisdom of understanding uh, the changeability of things. Um, that when we connect the dots of of our experiences, that we understand that every single part of our lives are connected and moving uh, forward in one area really allows us and enables us to move forward across the board. So what other types of appointments and sessions do you offer? So I, um, I offer different durations of natal chart reading. So I have a 30 minute option and I have a 60 minute option. Um, and then I also am the founder of a community, an online community called the Constellation Club. Um, which I'm very excited about. And it's a group of now over 300 individuals from all around the world. It's an online chat room that people are in constantly, um, where we are sharing our natal charts, our astrology, asking questions. Um, It's really applicable to all of different spiritual practices. So anyone who has a curiosity about whether it be crystals or tarot or numerology, there's psychic abilities, honing their intuition. There's different channels that we go into to have those conversations. And then I also host um, workshops twice a month for each new moon and full moon so that we can, I work with, each, I, I basically uh, FaceTime with each person in front of the whole group. And we all join together to talk about how these energies are affecting us, what we're moving through. And it really is an incredible community that we're forming. So where can people connect with you and be part of your community? So the best way to find 
all of this information would be through my Instagram, um, which is at Aliza Kelly. So that's A-L-I-Z-A-K-E-L-L-Y. And then I also have a website, alizakelly.com. That's where my online booker is for private sessions as well. And then I, it's Aliza Kelly on all social media platforms. Um, uh, so on Instagram, Twitter, I have my website, and then my email is info at alizakelly.com if someone has any questions about any of these different offerings. Well, Lisa, thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us here today. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Well, Lisa, it's been an honor to spend this time with you and, of course, to talk about your new book, Starring You. Starring You is available at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and all indie retailers. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. In a single moment, your life can change. Moments with Mary Ann is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus and grow, Mary Ann will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just what moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Friday and Saturday at 5 p.m. Pacific and 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Make sure to tune in and visit MomentsWithMaryAnn.com for more information.